Good afternoon and welcome to the Voices in Leadership series focusing on the nexus of leadership and science to create positive change in the world of public health. I am Betty Johnson and I have the pleasure to direct this program and to introduce our guest today. Our speaker, Dr. Howard Cole, contends that leadership is never easy. You must have a purpose, an encouraging heart, and be willing to challenge the odds to make a difference. Dr. Cole did just that and found his calling and passion when he first became a physician and observed his patients suffering from preventable ailments. He refused to accept the status quo and discovered his love for public health as a leader, an advocate, an academician, and public health promoter. His public service began in 1997 when he was Commissioner of Public Health for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This work continued and took on new dimensions when he was asked in 2007 to head the Division of Public Health Practice at the Harvard School of Public Health. As the Harvey V. Feinberg Professor of the Practice of Public Health, Dr. Coe published more than 250 articles in medical and public health literature ranging from tobacco control to health literacy. Never hesitating to honor a call to action, however, in April 2009, Dr. Coe received a call from President Barack Obama to join the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services as its 14th Assistant Secretary. After five years of federal service, Dr. Coe returned to the school last year as the Harvey V. Feinberg Professor of the Practice of Public Health Leadership. Dr. Coe has received a number of important awards, which include the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Legacy Award for National Service, the Distinguished Service Award from the American Cancer Society, and the 2014 Cedric Memorial Model Medal Award from the American Public Health Association. Dr. Coe graduated from Yale College, then went on to Yale Medical School and graduated, and received a Master of Public Health degree from Boston University. Postgraduate training was completed at Boston City and Massachusetts General Hospitals, where Dr. Coe served as the chief resident in both, and is board certified in four medical fields. Dr. Coe is an exceptional leader, one who embraces public health with conviction, humility, and sacrifice, and will share with us today some of his greatest successes and challenges. Before I turn this session over to today's interviewer, Dr. Kate Baker, uh, please, who is acting chair from the Department of Health Policy and Management and is the C. Borden Gray Professor of Health Economics, please join me as we welcome Dr. Howard Cole to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Howard, it's such an honor to get to talk with you here today, and I think there's a lot that you have to teach us and all of the students here about leadership. But first I want to ask you, you had a full career as an academic medicine clinician, and then you had these opportunities to go into leadership. What drew you into public policy and public health leadership versus the alternative career paths? Well, first, Kate, it's uh, great to be here, and thanks so much for sharing this platform with me today. Uh, you're looking at a very fortunate person. I'm a very blessed human being, um, and I'm very, very grateful uh, for my journey. Um, there's a wonderful saying from Kierkegaard, you can only understand your life backwards, but you have to live it forwards. That definitely applies to me. And when I was younger, I uh, trained in many medical fields and had a passion for caring for patients through direct patient care. Did that for over 30 years, in fact. That was something I cherished and something I consider very sacred, in fact. But as you heard from Betty, and Betty, thank you for that very kind introduction. Early on, I saw so many patients suffering preventable suffering. And early on, I just felt that it wasn't right. It started for me with tobacco addiction. I just saw patient after patient that I was struggling to care for, suffer, and often die from tobacco dependence. And look, throughout a hospital and you see people dying, preventable deaths, and it made me think that there was another way to help people be healthier. So I found myself being drawn into public health, into prevention, into policy. And uh, in hindsight, Kate, I, I really feel like I was answering a call. And now when I advise younger people, I tell them it's, there's a difference between planning a career and discovering your calling. 
I've been very fortunate to do both, and public health is truly a calling for me, and I'm very, very blessed to talk about it. Well, the issues that you've tackled, including uh, tobacco cessation and cancer prevention, are clearly enormous public health challenges and priorities, but they're also emotionally charged issues. When you think about public health, when you think about health care reform, this brings out strong, deeply held beliefs that are often at odds. How do you lead in those circumstances when the issues are so emotionally fraught and the path forward is so ambiguous? Uh, that's a great question. So we have so many challenges in our field and people are so passionate about the positions they hold. I mean, we're all passionate advocates. And I like to point out there's good news and bad news about passionate advocates. The good news is we're absolutely passionate about what we believe and we will not rest until everybody else agrees with us. <laughs> and the bad news about passionate advocates is that we're absolutely passionate about what we believe and we will not rest <laughs> until everybody else agrees with us. So if you bring people together and try to talk about common mission and common goals, respect people's passions and dissenting opinions, listen to them, and try to send the message as, as a leader that everybody can make a unique contribution. That, that's a really critical uh, leadership role. I've tried to do that in my career. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It requires tremendous patience and you have to listen. You have to respect different views. Uh, sometimes this is a, these are very charged situations where the need seems infinite and the resources are, always seem finite. And this is where the interpersonal skill, in my view, is critically important. You may not be able to make everybody happy, but at least you can show your respect for their point of view and try to involve them uh, in a coalition or a decision-making process that will move things forward. When you look back at the issues you've had to tackle, are there any successes that you're particularly proud of in bringing together people and leading to a solution to a problem? Well, the tobacco situation actually captures both success and failure all at the same time. And in fact, one of my lessons now looking back is that it's one thing to make progress in an area or start an initiative, but to sustain it over a long period of time is really our ultimate challenge. Uh, I'm with an audience of many talented leaders. And it's one thing for all of us to, to start something new in public health, that's great. But how do you sustain it so it really makes a difference over the long run? So tobacco is one area where you know, we can celebrate success. Last year I had the honor of uh, joining in the 50th anniversary of the Landmark Surgeon General's report at the White House. So we can say that uh, some eight million lives were saved from tobacco dependence over the past 50 years. But the challenge is that we still have um, over 40 million people hooked on this in this country. Uh, this is still the leading preventable cause of death in our country. The funding goes up, the funding goes down, public attention goes up and down. So another leadership lesson that I convey to my students is that if you want to do this work, you have to be in it for the long run. And you can't be discouraged from the day to day. Uh, you have to cherish the successes, honor your colleagues, and really be in it uh, with a tremendous sense of stamina and perseverance. So you've mentioned perseverance and you've mentioned mm -hmm. um, emotional sensitivity and yep. uh, skills in interpersonal relations. What are the other skills that you think are particularly important in the realm of public health leadership that you've been able to draw on in these settings? Well, I think one is creating a sense of urgency for any challenge that mm -hmm. uh, we face. An another is starting with a simple recognition that in public health, our challenges are so enormous that no one person has all the answers. Uh, I've been in meetings at the state and federal level where we bring people together to tackle a problem and the subject matter expert who leads, leads off the meeting uh, speaks for about five minutes and it's clear that we then have to turn to others to help out. And every challenge in our world of public health has to do not just with the science, but also policy, politics, communication, budget, law. And so if you're serious about leadership, I think you need to learn how to bring people together from different backgrounds. Again, say everybody can contribute here. Sort of orchestrate that effort the best you possibly can. Uh, I think these are some of the key themes for uh, us who are studying to be leaders, and I'm looking at the students in the audience today. I mean, I think we early on think of leadership as a form of stressing the importance of independence but as you get 
older and with more experience, you know that your major job is to cultivate interdependence. And that's, that's really what leadership in public health is all about. These are enormous problems that you've wrestled with. Mm -hmm. And as much as fantastic progress has been made, you note that we haven't solved these problems right. yet. How do you deal with setbacks and failures when you're trying to achieve something of vital public health importance and it doesn't always work? How do you be resilient in those circumstances? Uh, that's a great question. And uh, I think this is where the importance of taking a long-term view is absolutely important. Uh, you know, we all are in this field because we want to make a difference. We want to save lives. Um, we, we want to really leave a legacy of some kind. And this is a field where we can have a success one day and the next day we have to take a step back or two steps back. And so I think one test of a leader is can you be somebody who can take the long view when there are gains, of course, help celebrate that. But when there are setbacks, which are inevitable, can you be the person to reframe that, create some se sense of meaning and say, okay, well, we didn't get what we wanted today, but we learned this or that, and we're gonna get up tomorrow morning and try a new strategy or ju just let things rest for a while. If you are a person who wants instant results and are easily discouraged, this is not the field for you. <laughs> uh, but, but if you are committed in the long run, and I love this school because everybody here is, you say, here are some challenges that are very complex. <clears throat> we need people to work together. And if we take the long view, we can make a difference. And I've now been in this field long enough where I, where I can see differences in, in areas like tobacco and HIV in um, health reform, obviously, and had the honor of serving in a historic time in Washington. Uh, so change can happen. It's not easy. But uh, if you have commitment and you take the long view, you, you can see progress. Can, do you have any examples you can share with us from your days at HHS about some of the difficulties you had to overcome and the challenges in working in that environment? Well, of course, you're looking at somebody who served uh, through the birth and early implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So um, those initial days were very, very difficult. And I know we've had Secretary Sebelius here talking about that. Uh, now that it's getting a little quieter and we can celebrate at least 16 million people newly insured and rates of uninsured dropping by a third or perhaps more. Uh, we, we can see that you know, some five years later, this, this has really made a, a difference for millions and millions of people. And that's just the health insurance coverage part. Uh, I'm also very committed to the opportunity to really address fundamental questions in public health and health care. How we deliver care to people, how we improve quality, uh, and then most important of all, how we improve public health and prevention. And those major themes are in the Affordable Care Act. They haven't gotten as much attention as the insurance coverage aspects, but they're now going to have their time in the sun, I hope. And so th this is a time for our country to talk about that. So that all came out through a very, very difficult birth. Uh, and I was there for that. And I have tremendous respect for my colleagues at the department who, who shared that incredible life experience. Uh, there were some 80,000 of us at the department, and it, it's something I'll always treasure. And do you feel that it changed your leadership style at all to go through that experience? Absolutely. Again, uh, it's one thing to serve in a state position, and I was honored to do that. Um, but then to go to the federal level and see the levels of complexity just rise. And again, you have all these issues that people feel passionately about and not enough resources to address them. And in a place uh, like DC, uh, a lot of scrutiny. Uh, and part of the issues of leadership training, which I try to uh, teach my students, is that everything you do in these positions, you serve on a public stage. And you have to get used to being scrutinized and judged um, and people making comments to you about whether they think you're doing a good job or not. Oftentimes, they are directly negative comments, and you have to sort of get used to that, not, not take it personally, and say that you're in it for, again, for the long run, for, for the right mission. So that's what drove me uh, through all this. Um, it can be exhausting. And, and one of my takeaways to, to my students, too, is, by the way, uh, you can't do this alone. We all have people who care about us and love us, especially our family, uh, our spouses. Um, 
my, my physician wife has helped me every step of the way. Uh, there's a wonderful saying that uh, the definition of a family member is one who knows everything about you but loves you anyway. <laughs> and I think of that often. My, my wife and now adult kids went through a lot with me serving these positions, but they supported me and I'm just so, so grateful to them. Well, you served at a really interesting time in Massachusetts and then again right. at the federal level at HHS. How did your leadership experiences in those two settings differ and were there different skills that were necessary or was it just the same issues on a bigger stage? These are all great questions. <laughs> He's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, serving in the state position was um, a very challenging transition because I went from academia at the time, Boston University, to uh, running the state health department. So I was in my academic position at BU running a research team of about 10 people maybe. And then all of a sudden I was leading a state organization with 3,000 employees. So <laughs> quite honestly, that was the first time I started thinking about leadership <laughs> uh, and thinking, gee, they never taught me this in school, <laughs> right? Um, and that was actually the beginning of my passion for good leadership education because th these are s skills we all need to at least be aware of before we get th thrust into these um, important jobs. Uh, Massachusetts is also a fascinating place to serve as Commissioner of Public Health because we have a long history of, of public health, which we're very proud of. Uh, we have uh, a full-time state legislature here. Only nine states have that of the 50 in the country. Uh, we are in the top seven media markets in the country as well. So I was taken from an academic situation where I was a clinician seeing patients, teaching, doing my research, to running a department of 3,000 people, doing press conferences several times a week, testifying before the legislature, defending a budget that was always going up and down. And then, of course, in the middle of that, we had 9-11 and anthrax, which was just a life-changing experience for me, which is very, very hard. So I learned a lot <laughs> from that experience. was fortunate to come here to Harvard uh, for the first time through uh, the generosity of Dean Bloom. And then when I was called to go to D.C. Uh, to serve the president, uh, I felt lucky that I knew what the themes were. So the themes were generally the same, but the level of complexity, again, was very different. Now we're, we're talking about serving a country of 320 million, not, not the 6.3 million here in Massachusetts, a department of 80,000 people. Um, we started with H1N1, and so that was what I did from day one, literally. Uh, then the Affordable Care Act was, was passed less than a year later. So it was truly a historic time. A lot of that was absolutely exhausting, uh, but also absolutely exhilarating. So you go through these incredible experiences all within a short period of time and it, and it changes you and it makes you stronger and it makes you think a lot about the journey and, and what your what your mission should be. Well you mentioned teaching leadership and returning to right. the Chan School in a role of leading a leadership workshop and trying to train the next generation of leaders. We had a question from the web form that I wanted to follow okay. up on, on what qualities you think are really important for students and future leaders to try to acquire. And to what extent do you think those are teachable versus innate or learned only through experience? Okay. Those are great questions. Well, I feel very passionately that uh, leadership skills can be taught. There's a debate in the literature about whether we should talk about leaders as people or leadership skills that can be taught. Uh, I'm fascinated by the latter point of view. Um, the positions I held, I never dreamed I would have been serving in those posts when I was younger looking, looking forward. So uh, again, I feel very, very blessed. And for any student here, you could be plucked out of your uh, plans and asked to perform on a public stage and uh, take on tremendous responsibilities and you have to be ready. So uh, we do a lot of attention here first about standing for something bigger than yourself. That's probably my number one principle because there's a wonderful saying, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, <laughs> which I think is very important. And when people are interacting with you, the first thing they're, they're thinking is, is this somebody who really stands for a broader mission or are they just promoting their own self-interest? And so if you can stand for something bigger than yourself, that, that's a hugely important way to look at the world. Uh, your ability to uh, connect with people and build strong relationships and show respect, even the 
day-to-day -day logistics of walking in a room, saying hello to people, and then saying goodbye to people when you leave, and acknowledging them and listening to them. We, we have an era where we're so technology focused, most people are spending their time looking at their iPhones. And I often walk in a room with everybody looking at their iPhones and I'm saying, where's the human connection here? Where's the, you know, everybody you meet can be a partner with you in the public health journey. So um, those are things that we need to remind each other about all the time. Um, communication skills are absolutely important and uh, to, to develop succinct communication talents, I think is critical. Uh, being able to live in a world of ambiguity and conflict and be willing to try to resolve those conflicts if you can is something that we're trying to teach more here. I think those are very, very important skills. Um, and so th those are some of the themes that I've been thinking a lot about since, since coming back. So do you have specific recommendations for students who are looking to acquire those skills beyond, of course, taking your classes? <laughs> are there activities that you think help build those skills that people can engage in now? Well, I um, often think of my beloved late father's uh, favorite saying, which is, be broad like the sky. And he used to tell us kids that every day. And, um, we're in an academic setting where often you're rewarded for being very, very narrow so you can do your research and be an expert in your field, and that's something I respect a lot. But in general, I think leaders are people who like being broad, and I would encourage people to stay as broad as you possibly can, especially early in your careers, for a couple of reasons. First, you, you learn, and then you can learn from anybody. Secondly, uh, it keeps you humble, because this is a very humbling field. Um, and then if you do, you, you can, through that, find out exactly what your, what your calling is. And so I've talked about that term a lot. Uh, one, one of my favorite sayings is from Mark Twain, the, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you figure out why you were born. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I feel very blessed that it took me until I was appointed commissioner to figure out that's what I, <laughs> when I was in my mid-40s. So it took me a little uh, longer to, to find out my calling, but I, I feel very blessed to have gotten there. Well, so many of the problems that you wrestle with in public health are inherently interdisciplinary. Absolutely. You have clinicians and yep. researchers and politicians and lawyers all working together or working at odds to try to address a, a problem that's complex and multifaceted. How do you lead in that environment when you're coming from one disciplinary perspective mm -hmm. and you have one vantage point and a solution requires a much bigger tent? Another great question. And again, this is, this is where uh, first talking about common goals and common missions uh, is very important. There's a wonderful quote from Martin Luther King. We, we may have all come over on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. <laughs> so it's a sort of nice way to start any meeting where you're bringing pe people together. And then being as humble as possible, saying, listen, this is an interdisciplinary problem, as you just pointed out. No one person can solve this. Uh, I want to learn from you. Teach me. Teach all of us. Uh, we can all work together, and if we do this together, we can maybe find a solution together that we couldn't do independently. Uh, again, our field is so broad, uh, so interdisciplinary, that I think uh, a, a true public health leader is some, somebody who can do that, be willing to learn, be willing to express humility, and then show their respect for people about how they can contribute. Another question that we got from the online audience was, I think particularly appropriate for the setting where we are now, as a public health leader, how do you facilitate the generation of really good evidence about difficult questions and then moving that evidence into practice and better policy? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And so here we are in a school where we prize data and evidence and knowledge, and we want to be as certain as possible about what that evidence tells us before we act. That all sounds great when you're in an academic setting and you have hours to do these analyses and things, but oftentimes in a public setting, uh, you, you don't have that luxury. You, you get the best evidence you possibly can. You have to start with the science and the evidence. But especially if it's some kind of crisis, you then have to go public and say, we're making these policy decisions. 
We understand the science is not perfect, but we would recommend and, would, and you come forward with that, understanding that there is an ambig ambiguity to what you're saying. It, it takes folks like us physicians a long time to get used to that type of uncertainty. Um, but I think the more we do, uh, the better off we're going to be in terms of taking on these public roles. So one of the topics that you had to address uh, in this realm of uncertainty was how to best address disparities in health care and health outcomes mm -hmm. in the U.S. And one of our online questions focuses on how you generate a collective strategy where people have very different uh, stakeholder interests and vantage points, particularly in the area of health care disparities. Right. So that's a great question and uh, one that is very important to me. Obviously, my Asian American upbringing is critical to my sense of self. Um, and um, so I was very aware from being a little kid about being different in this society. And when, when you're a young child, that's the last thing you want to be. You don't want to be different from anybody else. But then as I grew older and became a physician, uh, I was able to use that to um, help my extended family navigate the healthcare mm -hmm. system. You know, people would say, gee, uh, Howard, your relative is having some medical issues. Can you, the doctor, <laughs> get involved, call grandma's doctor and make sure she's getting good care? Um, now in my public health posts, uh, I can articulate the message that, you know, we, we have a rapidly uh, growing country that is increasingly diverse. And I don't know if everybody's familiar with this projection that by 2045 or so, we are going to be a majority minority country in terms of race and ethnicity. So again, people can say, oh, I don't really care about this issue. This has nothing to do with me. But this is reality in this country. We are rapidly becoming more diverse, and not just by race, ethnicity, but also by sexual orientation, a level of disability, a geography, income, of course. So I had the tremendous opportunity to help lead the first ever uh, Health and Human Services Disparities Action Plan. And we wove the themes around the Affordable Care Act. And for example, we don't hear about this theme as often as I think we should, but racial ethnic minorities make up a third of our country and are half of the uninsured. At least that was the way it was uh, before the ACA was passed. So if, if you read the Disparities Action Plan, which was um, endorsed and, uh, by, by the Secretary, uh, it was, a, I would like to think, an important statement for our department. It sends the message that everybody should get health care, everybody should have the opportunities for the best health possible, regardless of their racial ethnic background, uh, and we have to do it if we're going to make the country stronger in the future. That's certainly an inspirational story. Thank you. With such wonderful leadership experiences behind you, what's next? What are your plans for the coming <laughs> years? <laughs> well, I am very blessed, and I want to thank uh, this wonderful community at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health for welcoming me, me back. Uh, I get to think about leadership, education, and training, reflect on my own journey, think, think about the things that I never got to be taught when I was a younger student and try to convey that to my students. So that's my uh, primary reason for coming back. And there's a lot of explicit leadership education and training going on throughout Harvard University, at the Business School, at the Kennedy School, uh, through uh, across the university in what's called the Advanced Leadership Initiative. So it's been fascinating to be part of that. Um, I also like to encourage people to go into government. That's not a popular theme sometimes, but I've never learned so much as in my state and federal positions. I've now spent over a decade of my life in government, which I, which I can't believe as a physician. Um, and I've never learned like that. And you not only learn about health and government and policy, but you learn about yourself. And you learn about what it's like to work under stress and to be stretched and asked to do things you never thought you would do. So I recommend that to all my students. Uh, and Encouraging people to go into public service is something I'm happy to keep promoting uh, during my now second run here back at uh, Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Well, you tell a really compelling story about the value of government service at the state level and at the federal level. I imagine that there are lots of other opportunities for leadership in less government-oriented stakeholder roles. Absolutely. Where else do you see an important role for public health leadership outside of government opportunities, which are, are of course, vital? That's a, another great question. And there is a wonderful saying that uh, leadership is not a position, it's a choice. Some people point out, for example, that Gandhi, one of the great historic leaders of time, never held any formal position. 
So if you care passionately about some injustice, uh, you think the status quo is unacceptable and you want to make a difference, you, you can start your leadership action right now, wherever you are. A lot of that's bringing the right people around you to address it, trying to be strategic about opportunities. Uh, and so you don't have to be you don't have to wait to be appointed by a governor or a president to, to have impact. Uh, you can do it because you feel this inner sense of calling, in my view. So I would, again, encourage that. Um, and you, you, these are also skills that you can start working on every day. Communication, the emotional intelligence, awareness, uh, interacting with people and showing respect and gratitude for them so you can uh, build your team, if you will. Um, and, you know, we're all part of this incredible public health journey where everybody can be a potential partner. So that's what makes it absolutely fascinating. Well, I think this has been inspir I know this has been inspirational for me, and okay. I believe that it has been for the audience, both in the room and online as well. Your story of transition from one leadership opportunity to the next and addressing some of these incredibly vital public health issues from tobacco cessation to healthcare disparities to affordable care and affordable insurance really is the future of public health leadership, and we're all grateful for your contributions. So please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank